This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. Hello, Penn State! Yeah. It's time for TWIV, This Week in Virology. This is episode 391, and today is May 25th. 2016. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Coming to you today from Penn State University at the University Park campus. And we are part of the meeting uh, called Living with Our Virome. And um, we're actually the last part of this meeting. I think all meetings should have a podcast associated with them to let the public hear what is going on, at least a little slice of it. And that's what's going to happen here. I've grabbed a couple of speakers at this viral meeting, and we're going to see what they have to say. But I'm really lucky to have two TWIV co-hosts with me. Uh, One is usually from North Central Florida. It's over there at the end, Rich Condit. Howdy, Vincent. Thanks for joining me. Sure enough. So Rich spoke at this meeting. He gave a talk called The Accidental Virologist. Right. And someday maybe we'll hear that on TWIV, right? Maybe. We'd like to hear it. (laughs) Now, also joining us, uh, this was a surprise edition. We didn't know he was going to be here. He's usually from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Great to be here. And uh, how did you get here? I I flew. You flew? Yes. Which airline? Uh, Just just me. (laughs) Yes. So Alan is a pilot. (laughs) <laughs> and he flew from what, Springfield? Um, Northampton, Massachusetts. Northampton. How long That's does good. that take? About two and a half hours out. It should only be about two hours back because we've got a, a westerly wind. And you can fly at night, right? That's not a yeah. problem? Yeah, that's all right. I'd like to get back you know, at a reasonable <laughs> hour, so let's, let's not do a two-hour yeah. episode. So thanks for joining us, uh, Alan. Sure. Pleasure. Uh, so we have two guests who spoke at this meeting, uh, and they're both from San Diego, which I didn't do on purpose. Uh, but it just so happens that they're out there, and I think they know each other in addition, which I didn't do on purpose. But uh, the first is a professor of biology at San Diego State University, Forrest Rower. Hello. Welcome to TWIV. Uh, thank you. Wanted to have Good you to on the here. program for a while. Thank you. In fact, I have your book here, which uh, will be my pick. This is this wonderful book, The uh, Life in Our Phage World. You guys know about this book? You ought to get it. Uh, It's wonderful. It's got chapters on every phage, beautiful genome maps, wonderful pictures of phages and life cycles. So a little plug for your book. We hope to give you the twiv bump. It says here, uh, I love the show, a big hi from Mary. I think that's your signature, right? Yeah. Is that right? So he signed it for me, so I'm very proud of that. So thank you. And also joining us from uh, the University of California at San Diego, he's a professor of microbiology, David Pride. Welcome. Hello, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. And you can see that Forrest and I violated the dress code, right? Yes. <laughs> Get it? Right? Yes. You got the white shirts and yep. some kind of pants. It's okay. We do things differently, right? Yes. <laughs> uh, this um, episode, by the way, is brought to you by Curiosity Stream. This is a subscription streaming service that offers over 1,400 documentaries and nonfiction series from the world's best filmmakers get unlimited access starting at $2.99 a month. And for our audience, the first two months are completely free if you sign up at curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the promo code microbe. We thank Curiosity Stream for their support of TWIB. It's a way of paying the bills uh, using our sponsors. So I uh, wanted to t- chat with the two of you today. Now, you may Wait a minute. Sorry, what's up? Weather? Weather. Yes. Can't see what the weather is like here. <laughs> yeah, but we know what it's like. What is it's it really like? Good. It's, it's 81 gorgeous. degrees outside. It's Beautiful. absolutely gorgeous. Really? It's just glorious. It's like Florida. Have you not been outside? Yeah, before, but I didn't yeah. notice. Okay. It's sunny, <laughs> it's summertime, it's clear, it's, it's lovely right. weather. That's good. Okay. Usually the way it That's is in, in Gainesville, right? Yeah, well, it's, right. it's, it's, Thank you. it's Thank getting you. into summer it's in like Gainesville. It's like this all the time good. in San Diego, right? Yes, it is. All right. These gentlemen both work on viromes, but I thought I picked them because I want to talk about the coral reef virome and the mouth virome. And I, and I wanted to use the tagline, if you ever wanted to know what your mouth and a coral reef had in common, this is it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anyway, let's hear a little bit about where you guys uh, trained from. Uh, David, where, where are you from originally? I'm originally from Nashville, Tennessee. Tennessee. Um, 
Yeah, I, I sort of have been all over in my training. I, I um, started out um, doing an MD PhD program at Vanderbilt, right. um, and in the in the middle of that PhD, I left with my boss and went to mm -hmm. NYU. Um, Who's that? Uh, Martin Blazer. Oh, very yeah. nice. Yes, Marty. <laughs> exactly, Marty <laughs> Blazer. Um, and, and after that, I did a lot of medical training and ended up back. Um, uh, in a different part of the country and uh, uh, at Stanford with David Roman and mm -hmm. now I'm out on my own in San Diego. So you did ID training, infectious disease? Infectious disease right? training, yes. Okay. So I was at Vanderbilt last year. I did a podcast with five of the MD PhD students. Oh my, my, my. Yeah, it was very nice. Very we good. called the episode Naturally Curious Chimeras. <laughs> Where did you go to college, by the way? I went to college at Wake Forest University. Wake Forest, yes. all right. And now you're in San Diego. And, and Forrest, where are you from originally? I'm originally from Idaho. Uh -huh. And then that's where I went to for my uh, bachelor's. And then I went to San Diego for mm -hmm. my PhD, and I've never left. So <laughs> I've been at either San Diego State or at Scripps Institution of Oceanography or UCSD at right. different points. So a lot less use for a snowblower than you had back in yeah, Idaho, oh, I definitely. <laughs> So I heard earlier that you had you did a joint PhD with uh, UCSD and SDSU, right? Yes, yeah. Right. Yes. So you just worked with two different people. Is that how that that worked? Uh, no, it's um, the at the time when I went, it was actually mostly citywide. So you could mm. be at the Sulk or at Scripps or um, at UCSD or SDSU, and then you um, did classes at UCSD and rotations in okay. that program. And then you picked a major professor and worked in their lab. And you had to have people from, uh, you had to have like two people from UCSD on your Got committee. And right. that's all. So yeah. you, you, both of you must know two people uh, who I know well out in that area. Stan Malloy. Yes. You both yes. know him. And He's Elio. my dean. <laughs> He's your dean, that's right. Yes, right. And uh, Elio Schechter. Yeah. I think Elio well. teaches a course at uh, SDSU, right? Or you, I'm not sure. Yeah, he does a lot of different courses. So he's on one of my other podcasts, yeah. and uh, love having him because he knows so much. He's you know 80 something yeah. years old and has a vast experience in microbiology. Yeah. So that's really cool. So um, I want to talk. I know you work on lots of uh, different viromes, forest, uh -huh. um, and today you talked about some of them. I wanted to start with the coral. Uh, virome, the whole coral shtick, <laughs> if you will. And I wanted to start with the holobiont. Right. And for, maybe you could tell us what that is and where the name came from. Right. So the holobiont came from um, the, the, we stole the name a little bit uh, from Margulis, though I'm not sure we knew that she had used it at the time. Okay. And um, what we were doing, it was uh, Nancy Knowlton when I was a postdoc at Scripps. And Nancy had done some uh, very interesting work where she had shown um, with Rob Rowan that the algae that live in the corals mm -hmm. changed depending on where they were in the water column. And over time, and people have figured out over subsequently that of course that's related to how much photosynthesis is going on. And so, so it's fairly adaptable in that sense. So you have the same species with different uh, symbionts. And then we started studying um, the coral associated bacteria and um, found roles of the bacteria in a whole bunch of nutrient cycling and, and mm -hmm. things of that nature. And based on that, we proposed that there were these ecological units that we would call holobionts and that you, to really think about what a, uh, any organism, any macroorganism is doing, you have to consider all of the pieces um, mm -hmm. as one unit. Okay, yeah. so the, holo, the coral holobiont is the coral itself, which is some kind yeah. of a polyp, right? It's a, yeah, so the coral is a, uh, the corals are super cool. They're uh, some of the uh, oldest, uh, well, the oldest extant animals left on the planet. And um, they, they form, they only have two tissue layers, and they sit um, over the, the skeleton, which you see, mm -hmm. and they lay down the skeleton. And then they have stinging cells, so all cnidarians are, uh, they have stinging cells, and so they're hunters. And then living inside them, they have the zooxanthellae, which are these modified uh, dinoflagellates. And then living on the surface is all of the bacteria. So the bacteria live right, right above the mucus. So all right. that's the holobiont. Yeah. But can we, do we include the viruses as well? Definitely. I, absolutely. Yeah, at right. the beginning. It's okay. always viruses. <laughs> yeah. so, viruses all the way down. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> so so uh, Forrest had, I think, the, the best 
line of the whole meeting, which is mucus is cool. Mucus is cool. Right? <laughs> yeah. so, so these things make a mucus layer? Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah, it's a, they're all mucus, actually. So most, you know, everything. <laughs> Biology is really yeah, all mucus. it's all about snot, you know. It's <laughs> can't go wrong with snot. <laughs> so, <laughs> we have a show title. We can't yeah. go wrong with snot. <laughs> so they, they, of course, you know, they're, they're massive. You know, you can have corals um, ten feet across easily. Mm -hmm. And those are just big, giant mucosal layers that are interacting with the um, ocean. And since you have about 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7 bacteria, depending, um, sorry, I said that wrong, 10 to the 6 um, bacteria per mil, 10 to the 7 viruses per mil washing over that surface, it's, um, mm. it is that mucosal layer that you have to come up with ways to exchange things across it. Okay. And get okay. Things so now, like, there must be a lot of exchange. You have many species of coral on a reef. Uh -huh. There must be a lot of exchange between them of microbes and other material. It used to be um, when we had much less data that we did not think that that was true. What, the good old days when you only right. have two data points and their <laughs> curves are much better. Um, so, so when we only had a couple hundred 16s's, we would say that um, there were uh, that each coral species had about a hundred different uh, unique bacteria associated with it. Uh, now that we can sequence a lot, we know that it's more like what you're talking about, that there are some resident microbes that are very stably associated with each coral species. But that's probably more like uh, a dozen in that range mm -hmm. that are stably. And then you have a whole another set of microbes that are coral associated. So they like corals and that you see them moving around on the reef from coral to coral. Okay. So I was, as I was reading some of your papers, I thought, and you actually confirmed this today, I thought we're actually all holobionts, right? Absolutely, yeah. And they're, uh, you know, people, animals, whatever, they have a microbiome, they have a virome, they have mucus. The yeah. mouth, mouth is part of our holo biont, right? right. You would right. Probably so we're agree. just the coral reef turned inside out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, literally. <laughs> and we made all these cool exchange services inside right. to try to keep them as sterile as possible, but not really. <laughs> so can you tell us how you, I, I, I know you've studied many different coral reefs pretty much all around the mm -hmm. world, right? Atlantic, Pacific. How do you sample them? You go on a boat? Yeah, so well, we do all of the above, but um, we often do expeditionary sort of science for the really remote ones. And in those cases, we suffer through living on a super yacht with a French chef who <laughs> takes care of us. And, and we'll go out um, to the, some of the most beautiful places in the world. But you know, someone has to do that. It's part tough of it. work. Yeah, someone has to do <laughs> who it. provides the yacht? Uh, actually, this uh, really rich uh, or, uh, shipping baron um, mm. from the Ukraine, I guess, and his, uh, it's, it's really cool because it's a kind of a miniature um, icebreaker um, that he takes through the Arctic and the Antarctic. And when it goes between the two, he'll let us um, basically get it for the cost of gas and food. Mm, wow. So, yeah. so, so yeah. then you have to go down to the reef in scuba gear and take yeah. samples. So they're never too deep, I presume, right? Well, yeah. So reefs, um, for the most part, will always, uh, I mean, uh, the, the, the coral reefs we study grow all the way. At low tide, they'll actually be emerged right. often. We always work at 10 meters. Um, mm -hmm. We do that all around the world. So we have this, uh, so depth doesn't become one of right. our main defining All right. Things. So you go down there in scuba gear, yeah. and then do you actually scrape the mucus off uh, the coral? No, we no. use hammers. Hammers? Yeah. Yeah, we take those beautiful things and we wow. hit them. You with actually the break them. Yeah, we use uh, uh, you know a metal punch and right. we metal punch out. Um, we're getting a little bit more sophisticated now, where we were using a an underwater drill to drill them out. <laughs> yeah, but and you bring it. So you to take a, a biopsy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do, you a, use a, do you use a hammer to? I would think you would need to get permission to do this. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. There, um, you always have to get permits, um, and those are kind of they're controlled both by the country um, that you're working in, uh, as well as when you bring them into the the U.S. There, it depends on the type of coral. Some corals are right. considered endangered, some are not. So you have to have CITES permits. So have them. you personally seen these reefs degrade over time as you've been doing this? Yeah. This yeah. must be, must hurt. 
It is, yeah, it's actually fairly depressing in some of the places you go to, like where you can just watch the, because it's very rapid. It, you'll have a coral reef that looks pretty healthy, like the corals are doing well, and two years later, it'll look essentially dead. So you um, mentioned today this is in part because of overfishing. Yes. But there are other things contributing as well, right? What are yeah. some of those? So the, the main things that are overfishing, um, nutrification from runoff, uh, from agriculture and deforestation, mm. just, which just directly jump things onto the reef. Um, in those cases, and in fact, in all cases, the microbial and viral components are important. The thing that's going on right now, which is, um, which is really problematic, is the El Nino is quite strong, mm -hmm. and that's heating up a lot of the ocean. And when that happens, the zooxanthellae, so those algae that live in the coral, um, get kicked out, and, when, and that very significantly weakens the coral. Okay. Too. Is there also acidification going on? There is, though I'm not sure that we've seen much effective acidification so far. Okay. It doesn't mean, as you're looking out in the future, it's not, that also isn't right. a great thing for them. So and, not, not to be a uh, uh, purveyor of doom, yeah. but how many more years at this rate are we going to have coral reefs <clears throat> at all? Well, corals, I mean, they're going to be here when we're gone. They've okay. been around for a long time, um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, our really beautiful climax reefs, um, mm. we're gonna, at the rate we're going, we're really thinking, you know, 2050, they're not gonna look anywhere like they do right now. Um, the good news is, is that there are lots of places in the world now that are protected, uh, mostly by the U.S. and by um, the Republic of Kiribati is the other major one that are uh, strongly protected and they're very remote in the ocean. So mm -hmm. um, that we should have at least some of those come through okay. and survive. So let's finish the, the sampling. You, you uh, take a hammer, you break off a piece. You yeah. put it in a 50 ml conical? Uh, cryo vials. The cryo so so we, they go in cryo vials, and yeah. then those get dropped into a dry shipper for the most part. Yeah, you know, that's uh, those yeah. uh, big foam things you fill with. Right. But they're, uh, they're full of seawater, of course, right? No. They're not? Oh, not usually. Usually we would have the seawater and pour it off at the, uh, before we drop it. In oh, you drop it in on the ship? Yeah. So oh, you, yeah. You bring up the coral in a bag or something? And, or it, Usually a whole bunch of, yeah, we'll buy several thousand zip lock bags, <laughs> <laughs> which are, you can imagine underwater what that looks like. So they're all over. And then we'll bring those back. And, and nowadays we take um, samples for metabolomes, which would go directly into 70% methanol, um, mm. stuff for RNA, which goes into RNA letter. And then we freeze stuff for the virus and uh, DNA work. And then the other thing we do is we go down with these fairly big, they're these uh, cubics, they're made by uh, Nalgene, and they're, they're collapsible. And then you just hook those up to a big uh, uh, bilge pump, and you suck water off the bottom. And mm. that's how we do the water sampling. <coughs> okay. So then when you bring them back on the ship, do you take them back to the lab, or you do anything right on the ship? So. In a couple cases, we actually sequence why we're there. So yeah. we'll take, um, uh, the, we've done that with the ion torrent, taken that to see and sequence why we're <laughs> out there. Um, but for the most part, they all come back and then we work on them. All the microscopy is usually done at sea or right. as much as you can. Okay, so what do you find in terms of microbes and viruses? Can you give us an overview? Yeah, so it's what we call microbialization, and um, what is happening is that on the on the pristine, healthy reefs, the of course there's all the normal symbioses that allow the coral uh, animal and the the other parts of the coral reef to be working, and it's kind of like what you would expect. There's nitrogen recycling, there's recycling of whatever limiting nutrients are available or are, are important in the system. Uh, help things that help detoxify, et cetera. And then um, when you start removing fish or you start adding a bunch of nutrients to the mm -hmm. system, um, the algae start to grow because they're not c controlled from top down uh, sort of behavior. So they're not being grazed, which releases more photosynthate in the water. So more sugars are just being pushed up. You get more bacteria and that leads to this uh, dynamic where the bacteria are carrying more prophage and the prophage 
in general seem to be bringing in a whole bunch of virulence factors. Mm -hmm. And that's why we think that the corals start to die. Mm -hmm. The virulence factors are probably just something that the, um, our working model is, is that the prophages are protecting the bacteria um, because they're, that's like their little lifeboat at that point. And the virulence factors are to protect from uh, protist grazing. And that it's just a secondary effect that they actually kill the coral. So the virulence factors are directly killing the coral, is that right? Yeah, we think, we, we see just a lot of them coming, and we know that we can add back the bacteria and mm -hmm. kill the corals. And you can imagine this creates a really bad positive feedback system because normally the bottom is all coral, so now you've killed some coral, and now you have more algae. Right. And then yeah. that algae feeds more bacteria. And so it's, a do, it's, yeah. a, it's a dysbiosis, like you see in, a, in an intestine of somebody right. who's overtreated with antibiotics or something. Exactly. And okay. it just gets, once it's running, it's really hard. And we don't know how to re reverse it right at the moment. So restoration sort of techniques in the, envir uh, in the marine environment in particular are. Short of bringing back the fish. Which is probably a non-starter. Right. Well, we can't bring back enough fish. That's the trick, right? So at one point, you had a certain number of fish grazing small amounts of algae. Now you have lots of algae. Right. And there's no way to add back enough fish, as far as we know. So uh, you had you talked about this interesting situation today, where when the microbes increase, you would think the phage would be killing them more, but you actually see more lysogenization. Yeah. And you call this piggyback the winner, is yeah. that right? Right, so the, the normal dynamic that we think of for phage um, interacting with the bacteria is that it's, it's the kill the winner dynamic where this strain of a bacteria comes up and then this uh, strain of phage comes along and kills it and you right. just get right. that constant replacement. That isn't what we're observing. What, we're, what we think we're observing is that the, uh, the phage I mean, there's a ton of old studies that also kind of point this direction, that as you get to certain densities, um, the phage actually uh, more like, are more likely to integrate mm -hmm. and become prophage. And that slows down uh, the kill the winner dynamics because now you have prophage in there and they're protecting that bacteria from other phage coming in. Do we have any idea what the phage is sensing to do that? So. Yeah, there are a couple master regulators of the carbon to nitrogen mm. uh, internally to the cell, which people think are important. That's about all we, yeah. those are the main ones that people have studied. Okay. We know when they come out, because we, there must be systems where they're popping out probably with uh, in environmental changes like summer, winter. And that would, of course, probably be DNA damage um, mm -hmm. to tell the phage to hop at that point. Do you do, um, I mean, the, this is obviously a very much a field study. Yeah. Um, do you, have you looked into trying to recapitulate any of this in a, in a reef tank in the lab? Yeah, great question. Um, so we do, we can recapitulate a fair amount of the microbial and viral interactions in the lab. And we can get a lot of the, um, the influence of the bacteria on the corals are often measured in the lab when we, at, so our typical thing would be check things in the lab and then come up with some <laughs> markers that we need to go looking for. Right. And so when we go to the field, we're ready to do, to do things. So most of the viruses associated with coral are phages, right? Yes. But there are some eukaryotic Right. right, so the main ones that we see are, um, that are not phage, are, that are eukaryotic viruses are actually uh, herpes viruses. Mm -hmm. And those um, tend to be in most of the corals that we look at. Um, and we know that we can get them to jump out, um, so to become uh, lytic by stressing out the coral. So much of the stressors oh. we talked about, like, uh, so the heat, um, mm -hmm. te temperature shifts, um, uh, acidification and nutrification will cause the right. uh, herpes viruses to. So I was, that was one of my questions: yeah. is it's in, the herpes viruses are infecting the coral, the the actual polyp itself, and they're latent infections. They're latent infections, but uh -huh. we don't know if they're infecting the coral. We just uh -huh. know that because it, the holobiont has so many other 
potential targets. We think it's probably the okay. coral, okay. but there's also fairly, there's a number of studies have seen um, uh, evidence of the viruses in the zooxanthellae also. Mm -hmm. So it's probably a mixture of the two. So this general life strategy of um, uh, latent infection and then reactivation under stress is something herpes viruses figured out a really long time yeah. ago. Yeah, probably like 500 million years ago or so. <laughs> something in that In range. the beginning yeah. there was herpes, okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the first four multicellular <laughs> thing had a herpes infection. <laughs> do, we, do we think these Herpes viruses are a benefit to the coral in any way? Well, the phages are in some ways, right? You know, I imagine it's the same as with the humans that, you know, there's trade-offs with your herpes mm -hmm. viruses, right? And um, it's probably exactly the same thing. You gain a little bit by having the herpes viruses. You lose under stress when you have them. So under stress, it becomes lytic and it kills yeah. the cell. That's the issue. Exactly. But there are no fever sores or anything like that. Yeah, you never know with the coral. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, but the, the phages are, are, my understanding is the phages are, are modulating the populations of microbes, and that's of benefit to the coral in the big picture, right? Yeah, in the big picture, we think that they're um, one of the main uh, immune systems of the coral. So really, they're mm -hmm. reinforcing the microbiota um, to, um, so that you select to have a certain set of microbes right. growing on you, and that that's mostly, at least in my opinion, <laughs> driven by the, the interactions with the phage. Yeah, so you talked about uh, a, a situation, say, in an intestinal epithelium where the, the phage are uh, specifically associating with elements of the mucus to create this protective barrier. You, so you've, you figure the same sort of thing is going on in the coral? Yeah, so we know it's basically happening in the coral too. So I mostly talked about the human side, but the coral, we have very similar sorts of data. The only difference is, is we don't have as nice of uh, chip systems to do the dynamic. We did that paper on TWIV, do you remember, Rich? Uh, um, <coughs> no, you don't oh, remember? Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was the PNS paper that showed this mucosal uh, phage immune system. Okay. Yeah, we right. did it. It's a long time. So you, you think essentially it's a similar situation in the coral mucus. The phage are there and bacteria come in, they would destroy them. Yeah, right. so I actually think that that's an all, essentially all mucosal surfaces that have a, a large microbial population around them are going to be that way. So uh, all of us, and in fact, David, that brings to mind the oral mucosa, which is probably a similar situation, right? Yeah, I mean, I certainly think so, that, that, that the oral mucosa probably will behave in the same um, yeah. uh, fashion because, you know, there's so many phage that are there, as Forrest actually showed in that paper. Now, you, you two have a couple of papers together, right? Do you remember? I believe only one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. just one? Yes. <laughs> well, and that had to do with coral? No. So what did it have to do with? Oral virome. Yeah. It was the oral virome. All right. So you, uh, all right, so let's talk about the oral virome. Sure. What got you interested in that of, as opposed to the virome anywhere else in us? Well, I was, uh, you know, I, I actually got my start working on Helicobacter pylori. Okay. Um, and one of the things that I uh, wanted to do sort of throughout my career is I spent a lot of time not in a laboratory. Um, and during that time, I wanted to stay involved in research, so I actually kind of used some of the computer programming skills I had mm -hmm. to become a bioinformaticist. And a, a lot of the bioinformatics stuff I worked on um, actually had to do with viruses. And for example, how viruses, uh, particularly prophage, tend to use their nucleotides in patterns that resembled their host. And they would mm. do so for obvious reasons. Um, so my sort of interest in viruses um, sort of led me to work uh, with David Roman, um, who was interested in the, the uh, human microbiome, mm -hmm. and he was willing to allow me to come into his lab and okay. work on viruses. Okay, and of course, the oral <laughs> viral microbiome is a lot easier to sample. You don't have to get on a boat, yeah. right? Yeah, well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. it's, um, you, you know, it, it's actually quite easy to sample, uh, uh, particularly if you're just looking at saliva, which is how we started out, okay. because it's just so easy to get individuals to spit into a tube. The, the hard part tends to be getting a dentist to actually do a full periodontal exam on those same individuals. So uh, when you went to uh, Forrest, 
did you go to him for bioinformatic help? Is that I, actually I, I got my never gone to me for bioinformatic. Help. <laughs> 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 sure, sure. Yeah. No, he, um, in, in fact, um, you know, when I entered uh, uh, David's lab, uh, I didn't know anything about the human virome, and I, you know, we didn't even really know that it existed, and we needed to learn techniques. So I actually learned all the techniques I I know really from uh, going down and spending. Was it a week or just a few days in Forest Lab? You didn't go out on a ship and go to... Yeah, no, to that program. was definitely not on the agenda. Oh, okay. So you thought he said he wanted to study the coral <laughs> microbiome, but he said oral. <laughs> yeah. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> Mistake. Yeah. Absolutely. I was really worried you'd show up with some of David's poop samples, actually. <laughs> <laughs> right. So you sampled not just saliva, but then... Oh, the, the gums and the mucosa, the entire mouth, right? Yes, uh, you know, the, one of the uh, interesting things about the uh, mouth and, and just the human body in general is that it's made up of all these different surfaces or mm. we sort of refer to them as micro niches. Um, and one of the things that we sort of learned early on in terms of oral microbiome work is, you know, that you know, each different part of the, of the mouth has its own microbiome. You know, the tongue looks different than the cheek, looks different than the subgingival crevice. So um, mm -hmm. bacteria basically have, you know, they compete for just about every single environment uh, within the mouth. And we sort of see something analogous to that when it comes to viruses. What's the subgingival crevice? Oh, the subgingival crevice. So it's that space in between the gums uh, and the teeth that's an anaerobic oh, environment hard. in the mouth. Yes, yes, yes. So the, okay. the microbiome of the subgingival crevice is much, much different than, uh -huh. say, you would find in uh, a planktonic uh, a saliva. So it's actually directly comparable. I mean, you're talking about a, a niche that has these subdivisions within it. There must obviously be sort of a general population that washes over everything, Absolutely. the saliva yes. microbiome, I assume, exactly. and then within each reef, if you will, there, there <laughs> are these subdivisions of it. Sure, absolutely. You know, and we sort of first thought, or at least I, I first thought when we were looking at all these different niches in the, in the mouth, that what we would find that was that the saliva was really just the compilation of, you know, the tongue microbiome and the, and the uh, pharyng pharyngeal microbiome right. and the subgingival crevice uh, microbiome. It, it turns out it's actually a bit more distinct than we would have thought, um, uh, particularly, you know, the subgingival crevice being such an anaerobic environment that it, it really does does tend to be fairly distinct from what you find in saliva and what the few things uh, that are in common between those two have probably just washed out of the subgingival crevice into the saliva. And do you see as much variation between individuals that you see in, say, fecal microbiomes? Yes. Um, well, actually, no. Uh, okay. So, it, I mean, we do see uh, reproducible variation between individuals. Um, I have to say we, and part of why we've sort of moved into doing a lot of uh, uh, fecal microbiomes is that the variation between individuals uh, is to a much greater extent than we find in the, in the oral cavity. That's actually kind of reassuring. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Nevertheless, well, uh, it, it, tell okay. me if I got this right. In, the, in your talk, you, uh, one of the points was that uh, people living in the same household tend to have at least overlapping microbiomes. Is that correct? Yes. With some commonalities? Uh, absolutely. Uh, and then you talked about uh, how, for example, if an individual undergoes an antibiotic treatment or something like that, it can impact on their microbiome. It does. Um, uh, I'm wondering... Does that then show up in other individuals who have not been treated? Very and if so, how rapidly? Yeah, very good question. So, um, in, in fact, that's why we originally did that study. Um, and I, I can tell you a, a, a quite a bit about what we found with the bacteria. Um, it's a lot harder to work with the viruses, unfortunately, okay. in that in that sort of situation. So, uh, one of the, the so the, the the design of that study was that we um, took a group of individuals who shared households, um, where one individual received an antibiotic and the other uh, received a placebo, with the idea in mind that the individual who uh, received the antibiotic would have distinct impacts on their microbiota. And then the question becomes, well, do we see analogous impacts on that individual who has uh, close contact uh, with them? And in fact, it kind of depends on the antibiotics. So we, use, we choose, chose two different antibiotics. Uh, they're the two most commonly prescribed antibiotics in the U.S., azithromycin and amoxicillin. Um, and it turns out that 
for amoxicillin, um, usually an individual is impacted. You don't see a lot of impacts on their um, housemates. Um, but when we do azithromycin, particularly when we're talking about gut microbiome, you see a tremendous impact on the diversity of their gut microbiome. Mm -hmm. And you also see an impact on the diversity of the microbiome of individuals that they live with. And in that study, we had separate control group who didn't receive any therapy, who resided in different households, and we didn't see any impact upon them. So mm -hmm. it, it looks like there's certainly collateral effects of certain antibiotics on your microbiota uh, for your close contacts. Does this show up pretty quickly uh, in, the, in the contacts? Yes. Yes. Um, so the, the impact is probably within days, absolutely. So back to the saliva, you said it was relatively constant and unique compared to other parts of the mouth. Is, is it acquiring its microbiome in the gland or only after it has, has come out? That's a, that's a really tough question to answer. Yeah, I don't think you probably haven't done yeah. many biopsies of this. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I, I don't really know. You know, every surface of the mouth is coated with bacteria, um, mm. and those are probably what make up the um, uh, the saliva. So I, I don't I don't think that much of what's coming up from the gland is yeah. a, a big impact on okay. the salivary microbiome, but I, I just don't know the answer. So maybe it's just a matter that the saliva picks up certain species, Absolutely. right? And others simply don't come off into, Absolutely. into the saliva. Absolutely. Particularly a lot of the oral streptococci, which are highly prevalent uh, mm. uh, in your saliva. We see a ton of streptococcal viruses, uh, okay. et cetera, in the saliva. So uh, just like the coral, most of the viruses in your mouth are or phages, right? Well, I would say most of what we can identify. You know, um, yeah. no one's looked at, for example, RNA viruses in the mouth just yet. So, um, you know, and if they represent half the viruses and most of those are eukaryotic, mm -hmm. then that, that uh, to some extent sort of changes our story. But definitely in terms of DNA viruses, the vast majority of what we can identify mm -hmm. uh, are in fact a bacteriophage. And, you know, that doesn't mean there aren't eukaryotic viruses because in every individual we look at, we find, you know, eukaryotic viruses, right. herpes viruses, tortinovirus, viruses, uh, circle viruses, et cetera. Um, but they tend to be, quite frankly, dwarfed by yeah. the amount yeah. of phage that we can identify. So uh, it's my understanding, you tell me if this is right, when you brush your teeth, you get a bacteremia? You do get a transient bacteremia. So absolutely. you must also get a viremia, transient viremia, right? Well, um, <laughs> you know, with that said, you already have a viremia. Um, <laughs> you know, as, uh, you know the, the, uh, as I, I don't remember if I mentioned it in this talk at all, but, um, and, and actually some of that came from Forest Lab years ago. Um, you've got your own blood microbiome. That's true, uh, That's Or right. blood virome, um, and there's a ton of viruses in your blood. So um, uh, can we pick up, for example, minutes or even seconds after toothbrushing uh, a distinct change in the, yeah, uh, yeah. In the uh, blood virome? Probably. Um, but, you know, uh, yeah, uh, from yeah, work yeah. in our lab that we haven't published, we know that a lot of the uh, viruses that we find in the blood virome uh, are phage, and most of those phage uh, appear to be uh, phage derived from the gut. So, so with these so many phages in our mucosal surfaces and in blood, do we make immune responses against them? So not usually. So this is, I think, going to be super cool because I think what they're doing is, so we know and some work that we're uh, doing um, over the last maybe year, year and a half, is that the, the cells um, sitting at the epithelial are grabbing phage and uh, transcytosing them <coughs> and probably getting them right into the interstitial tissue mm -hmm. and, and our in, interstitial fluids, which then end up in the lymph which you probably would not mount an immune response because you don't have any adjuvants around. So you can imagine that we're probably getting, putting a whole bunch of phage into at least the lymphatic part right. without right. really mounting an immune response. But the phage in the blood should make it, should do some sort of immune response, should encounter a, an antigen presenting cell at some point, get brought to a lymph Yeah, node. only if you had enough of them. So it'd yeah. be like getting up to that critical mass. Okay, I don't so know. the question is, has anyone looked in, in humans in their serum for antibodies to vary all these phages that you're seeing? Yeah, so we did a lot of that, and there are a lot of old studies that yeah. said that, so if you inject them, it's, you get a nice uh, immune response. In fact, the, the yeah. outside of the you can really mount a thing, but for the most part, you don't see strong anti-phage uh, immunity. Yeah. yeah, I mean that's part. 
that's part of the problem with phage therapy. You, you inject the bolus of phage and you get an antibody response and it's cleared relatively quickly, right? Right, so yeah. It's, it's a, and in the mouth virome, the same thing, would you know mucosal antibodies against the viruses that are present or maybe you haven't looked, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't fully know the answer to, uh, to, uh, to that. And, and part of it is that, um, you know, we're just in the past few years recognizing the extent of how many actual phage are yeah. really there. Um, so uh, we don't really have great targets just yet mm. um, as, as to which ones to target to look for immune responses. So by extent, you mean the, the, the diversity or the numbers? Both. Both, actually. The diversity is really high. Um, Can you that, give us an, an idea? It, it's it's sort of tough to say in terms if you look in terms of genotypes you're talking probably in the numbers of, of low thousands of, mm -hmm. of different viral genotypes that will be in your saliva at any given uh, point in time those are viruses those are uh, viruses most of which are phage okay, okay. Yeah. how does that compare to the gut uh, virome it's it's interesting and, and that that that's also a bit of a hard question to answer because you know the gut is has such vast surface yeah. area um, but if you were to just compare that at any single time point in time what does your salivary what's the diversity of your salivary virome uh, compared to what comes out in feces mm -hmm. which is really representative of the, of the uh, lower colon uh, in fact the salivary virome is much more uh, diverse mm. uh, than the gut virome. But if you correct for all the surface area, um, I would assume that um, the gut is much more diverse just in general. Also, you can't really sample the gut properly. You really need yeah. to scrape the wall, right? Not just yeah. take feces. So what is sure. the extent of the coral phage virome in terms of species, roughly? Uh, about 10,000 10, thousand square centimeter. Yeah. And in terms of species, how many different species? Uh, Ten thousand per species. Yeah, species, species per well, square centimeter. Whatever species. Well, whatever. Per yeah. Page, yeah. Got it. Yeah. Oh, okay. So the the um, how many people have you looked at in terms of mouth viromes so far? Oh, goodness, uh, it, you know. I, it's, it's almost embarrassing to say that we're probably still under a hundred. Uh -huh. um, so it's a, it's it's a really small cross section of um, yeah. uh, of what we have, and, and part of that is just the viral work is so expensive to do that um, uh, you know, and, and a lot of the studies now that we do longitudinal studies, so we, we've looked at subjects over a course of say 11 time points over mm -hmm. um, 60 days um, mm -hmm. and you know, and produce a ton of viromes, but the number of subjects typically is small because yeah. you know, uh, uh, it's just so cost prohibitive to do that many viromes. And that's because you need to do the entire genome, right? You have to do the whole viral genome as opposed to 16S ribosomal yep. RNA, right? Right. Exactly. You need a certain, you need to achieve a certain depth of sequencing right. in order to uh, get a pretty good picture well, of what the Maybe you should go to like. Forrest for some advice on, on that. Uh, <laughs> he's done more. <laughs> he's done an amazing amount of work, actually. So, so you've crazy. done the, the oral microbiome and the gut microbiome. There's other areas that you've sampled as well, right? Yes, so we've done the urine virome. Mm -hmm. uh, we've, as you guys saw a little bit of, we, we're in the process of doing the virome of uh, cerebral spinal fluid. Um, right. You know, uh, one of the things we really want to do in my laboratory, more just to build a library and maybe less for publishing purposes, um, is to do the virome of just about every body fluid there is, just so that we have a really good library of the viruses that inhabit the human body. You so, could volunteer. Oh. <laughs> You're, you're welcome to volunteer. In fact. Uh, nothing is sterile. Yeah, no, nothing is sterile. You know, we're we're doing the um, uh, the virome of um, the biliary tree right now. Um, we're doing uh, the virome of other sort of body fluids and wounds. Yeah. So I was thinking about uh, uh, skin. Are, are you doing like? Skin? We're not. We tried. Um, it, it's really <laughs> difficult to do. Um, in fact, I uh, I volunteered to be uh, 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 the study we were trying to do of the skin in my lab, which was a, it was a pretty big failure. Um, <laughs> so you know, how would like, you do that? Is that like a punch biopsy? Well, or I something? thought we would do it by me doing a full body swab. So uh, <laughs> literally, <laughs> yeah. So I, I mean, I sat in the lab and I swabbed every bit of my body, like a hundred different swabs, put it all into a solution, and. All we found were a few pseudomonas phages. It was uh, right? it was unsatisfying. But other groups have done it. Uh, you know, there's um, Jeffrey Hannigan who works with uh, Elizabeth Grice. Um, they actually have done a pretty good job of finally doing the skin virome. Um, so in fact, um, uh, the one thing that they found was that 
uh, comparatively, the skin virome is much more diverse than I would have ever thought. Um, mm -hmm. It's on the order of the gut and, uh, and the saliva, which is just... I was just thinking about skin because, you know, relative to every other surface that we've talked about so far, it doesn't have mucus, right? Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. right. But the outer layer is dead cells, right? right? So you have to get, maybe you have to get below that to get some... Did, so when you swab yourself, you think you're just getting the outer dead cells? No, I mean, I was pretty intense. In <laughs> okay. you know, we, we really wanted that to work. All right. Uh. Well, at least you got a good bath, right? Sure. Right. Um, so I, I'm on one of my other podcasts, Dick Sunday Pommy, I always used to say there are seven sterile body fluids. This is old school stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And now that's not true anymore. There are no sterile body fluids. You, you know, right? we can't say there are no, but I, I seriously doubt there are any. So the vitreous humor of the eye is, is not sterile? The vitreous humor of the eye, in fact, we've got quite a few samples that we're going to be looking at. Uh -huh. um, and I, you know, I, I, I'm pretty certain it's not sterile. Wow. There's just no way. So there are both, probably both bacteria and viruses in yeah. there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's in communication with the CSF. And yeah. we know, in fact, for work that Forrest helped us do, um, that there's about 10 to the 7th to 10 to the 8th virus particles per mil wow. in CSF. And what about the brain proper? Did you volunteer some? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I'm not sure. You know, I, you know that's, that's, that's probably the one real big benefit of being a, a clinician is that, yeah. um, you know, I, I probably could get access to some, to yeah, some brain yeah. uh, tissue and actually do those sorts it's of things. It's not been done, basically. At some point. Not that I know of. Um, you know, uh, some uh, groups have, you know, taken animal tissues and ground them up and look for viruses, and it, it's fairly obvious that, you know, uh, you can find viruses. So I, I would not be surprised if you could wash the brain really well to get all the CSF off, mm. grind it up, and probably find it has its own unique virome as well. There's a paper, I think two years ago, suggesting bacteria in the brain. You know, you could see morphologically and uh, genome and everything was there, but it's not, I've never heard of another report, and it's hard tissue to get, but at autopsy you could quickly get Absolutely. samples and do this. Is it something you're interested in? I am, you know, uh, I'm interested in a lot of things, yeah. though, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a hard process to get access to, to brain tissue. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, but it's definitely something I'd be interested in. In fact, it could be a, a, a sort of a, a nice sort of side story in looking at the CSF. Yeah. So I'm, I'm wondering, it sounds like you haven't done this, but it's interesting to, to take a group of people long term and follow them and look at the oral virome microbiome and see how it changes, especially in response to illnesses, changes in diet, locale, and so forth. You, you don't know any of that yet, right? Sure. You know, um, the, the, the longest we've done it is a year, basically. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you want to consider a year long term. It's pretty um, long. Yeah. And, and we do find in, in both the gut and the oral cavity that we get this sort of drift, you know. And, and I've seen some nice figures, although they were never published at David Relman's lab, where you can show that the microbiome just sort of drifts over time. Mm -hmm. apart. Um, and in particular, when you have something like an antibiotic perturbation, you get a huge decrease in the diversity. It comes back up rapidly when you remove the uh, antibiotic. It never returns to baseline. And then it sort of continues that drift so that when we do these sorts of studies, and I was saying, we can tell who you are just by looking at the viruses in your mouth. Um, and, and absolutely, we can do so. But, you know, if we look at the distances between those points, we mm. can see that sort of slow drift where there's a portion of your virus that's turning over over time. So if an individual has a certain sort of viromic signature, if you like, mm -hmm. if you treat that person with antibiotics and they, you know, crash and then come back, do they come back to the same signature? Or does you it? know, it's, it's interesting the effects of antibiotics on your DNA virome, at least, um, because the one thing that we can see is that uh, when you give at least long-term antibiotics to an individual and you look at their virome, the diversity doesn't change at all. It stays the same. But what happens is that some of those viruses of the bacteria ended up, end up being replaced by eukaryotic viruses. So it's almost just like the niche is being vacated and other um, uh, viruses mm -hmm. are just feeling that, filling that gap really quickly. But even in those cases, you can still identify who they are. There's enough of your sort of original virome that's left over that you can still tell who an individual is. Have you looked at relationships between oral virome and, say, tooth decay or gum disease and how it's impacted? Yes, 
Uh, absolutely. Well, we, we don't know if there's a cause and effect yeah. Uh, yeah. at this point, but uh, uh, one of the uh, things that was noticed really early on, particularly in people with severe periodontal disease and dental caries, um, is that their oral microbiome is different. Um, mm -hmm. And in fact, you can uh, get a good idea of who has periodontal disease just by you know sampling their subgingival crevice and uh, seeing the bacteria that are there. And it turns out that uh, you can see the same thing, okay. uh, same sorts of signatures and viruses as well. And it's, it's really highly statistically significant. So uh, one day we're going to have broad spectrum antivirals, I think. I don't know when, but I bet we will. And so you're going to, as a doctor, you're going to face people who are on these and they have no, no mouth virome left. <laughs> All right, what, what are gonna, their problems going to be as a result? Oh boy, that's a, that's a good question because I, I can't imagine how you could wipe out all the phage well, just without it would wiping be hard. out the bacteria as well. Um, well, if you took all the phage out and all the eukaryotic viruses, what would happen? Boy, and I'll um, ask you the same living, question it's, it's for the coral reef. Boy, uh, you'd almost have to live in a bubble, I, I think. You know, because yeah. um, uh, you know. You know, I sort of look at the mouth as an extraordinarily competitive environment. Um, mm. And you know, those microbes, including some of the viruses that are probably supporting the bacteria um, that are there, once you start removing it, removing them, you're just opening up that environment yeah. for pathogens to come in. Um, and pathogens love those sort of dysbiotic states, um, particularly, you know, like what we see in people with advanced HIV and their mouth is so dysbiotic. And that's why they're at such high risk to mm -hmm. get infections like candida yeah. uh, right. uh, uh, in the mouth. So I would not be surprised in those sorts of situations. Yeah. If you got rid of the viruses, you may promote something like, you know, oral candidiasis. Could you imagine then at some point in the future when we understand the relationships better, using phage just in the mouth as therapy to correct yes. aberrant conditions. Yes. Yes. And I, I base this only on things that I've thought from Forrest's <laughs> work, actually. We've, you know, because I've been sitting here thinking, gee, I, you know, it would be really nice if we had a nice Campylobacter, Salmonella, Shigella phage, and we could just have people take those daily as a probiotic, mm -hmm. and then we don't have to worry about treating all these diarrheal illnesses that we see in the ER every day. Right. I bet it happens one day. I do too. So Forrest, if you took all the phages from the coral reefs, Similar yeah. situation? Well, I definitely agree with opening up niches. We'll just let other things yeah. come in. Um, so we know pretty well in the ocean, because we can get rid of uh, the phage. We can filter them out and see what happens. And uh, the, the system slows down a lot, mm. effectively. So what will happen is uh, the bacteria go up, and they hit a different carrying capacity. Mm -hmm. So there's more mm -hmm. of them. And, and then they'll just stay there. And if you add the phage, they'll actually go back down. So you'll, you'll lose a lot of the bacteria right. cells. You gain phage, of course, and the system is moving much faster. And, and photosynthesis, for example, by um, the cyanobacteria and so forth in the open ocean, uh, looks to be very dependent on phage activity because right. they need the, the nutrients to be blown up and released and okay. everything. No. I, I, would, I would think that you know, from what from what you said, it sounds like if you mess with any one component of this, you're 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 potentially reaching a crisis where the whole thing spins out of control and crashes. Right? Yeah, you could easily do that. Yeah, in fact, we saw some work from John Kirby at this meeting showing that the the speed at which um, the you know he was actually showing differences in the uh, metabolism of the of the mouse, it was the mouse model, um, depending mm -hmm. on how many yeah. phages were there. I'm looking for John, but he's not here. He's Good. at the bar. You're at the <laughs> bar. Well, the whole world is going to know that John Kirby left this podcast to go drinking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody will be surprised. He, uh, I can fool with him because he was, we had him on TWIM once before, uh -huh. talk about mixobacteria. Um, so what is your next uh, trip? for us to go sample? Do you have one scheduled? Uh, I do, but it's different. So I'm gonna drive across the country with my 10-year-old and, and Nanopur, uh, the minion, <laughs> and sequence things as we go. Just random things? <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, we're, t we're trying to come up with the, what the real challenge is. So we, um, uh, we were just in Curacao, and mm. she and a, another friend had sequenced a number of things down there. And so as we do this drive, we're going to do a whole bunch of that. And then we go back out to the field. Um, mm. uh, 
we, we're always on cruises with the NOAA, um, and they go out and the, this summertime, about a month and a half from now, cool. two months. Well, I'm, I'm certified, and I've got time, and I, I'm good with a hammer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is, are there phages in this? There are all assuredly phages. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's open. open. You're, yeah. you're yeah. No, not that <laughs> part. Not that part. And there's <laughs> top, top water has about uh, 10 to the 5th, 10 to the 6th bacteria per mil. You know, most, I think yeah. most people don't realize that. Yeah. They think they're getting pure, yeah. right, water when they buy this. Yeah. Yeah, the, those are a little less because the uh, phage stick to the plastic because yeah. the plastic is still yeah. active. Um, so it has a little, it, it'll do it. But the, the water you drink is normally pretty filled with phages. And it's probably good, right? Yeah. It's, yeah, it's great. It's, it's so when yeah. are you going to do your next uh, mouth sampling or any... Uh, microbiome virome sampling. Got one scheduled? Uh, yeah, we, we do. I just have to finish the IRB, actually. <laughs> okay. Um, but, you know, um, one of the things that, that we're really sort of been interested in is um, putting a timeline to how quickly, you know, these microorganisms are shared to, with people mm -hmm. in households. So I had mentioned that the, the last study we did, our biggest deficiency was the fact that, you know, we were just happy to get people to enroll in the study. Yeah. Um, therefore, you know, if you've been living together for six years or six weeks, it didn't really matter. We take everyone and now we're going to get a little bit more strenuous in our criteria and only take people who are just about to move in together and mm -hmm. figure out exactly how quickly they're sharing microbiota. Uh, Rich, uh, we have five minutes. You want to do some picks? Sure. This is a tradition on TWIV, Science Picks of the Week. What have you got, Rich? I've got uh, a video uh, from a, a series called Smarter Every Day that mm -hmm. I just discovered. Okay, he's got a he's got a I guess a YouTube site or something like that, but this one caught my attention. It's on helicopter auto rotation. So as a matter of fact, it's got a little bit in it from uh, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson because apparently at some point Neil deGrasse Tyson was making a distinction between a fixed wing aircraft and a helicopter, and he says, you know, a fixed wing aircraft. If the power goes out, you can glide you to a glide. stop, but a helicopter just drops like a brick. And this guy said, no, 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 no. No, no it'll okay? continue flying. And I, not I, for very I, long, I, but it yeah, will continue I knew flying. about this, but I'd, ne this, I'd never seen a good demonstration of it. Because if, the, if in a helicopter the, the power goes out, it, it falls, and the, uh, the air rushing past the rotor Keeps turns it spinning. the rotor. Okay? It becomes an auto gyro. And, and yeah. you can... Uh, as you approach the ground, if you feather the rotor right, you can actually break the fall and land normally. So it doesn't fall like a brick. And so this is a good demonstration of it. I thought it was cool. And uh, the other videos that you can link through that are pretty good as well. Yeah, so this is uh, Smarter Every Day. Smarter Every Day. And they have, this one video has 2.4 million views. Wow. And they basically stole a helicopter. And I That's watched pretty, one other one, which is him, nice. uh, firing an AK-47 underwater. <laughs> he does a lot. He does a lot of uh, right. This is, I would say, a you typical rich content. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's a pretty sort of macho science bit. This. Mm -hmm. Did you have a pick, Alan? Yes, I do. Um, this is from uh, just uh, the other corner of Pennsylvania. Um, so that's why I decided to pick it this week. Um, at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia has mm -hmm. a... Uh, uh, a game that they just put online. It's a classic 8-bit graphic type of thing, but you play it in your web browser. It's called Vax Pack Hero. And you're exploring around trying to stop the viruses using cards. And there's actually apparently a collectible card game that goes with it nice. if you, if you want to get a hold of these. So it's just VaxPackHero.com. And if you're of a certain age, try not to get a foreigner song stuck in your head when you say <laughs> Vax Pack Hero. Nice. Um, I like but, that. Uh, it's, it's fun. Well, this is my pick of the week, all right? I Thank picked this you. before. I'm going to pick it again because you're here, and I think that's pretty cool. Life in Your Phage World, a centennial field guide to the Earth's most diverse inhabitants, as we heard today. They're everywhere throughout us. Forest rower Mary Yule, Heather Mon, and now Hisakawa. Illustrations by Leah Pantea and Ben Darby. is really gorgeous. Um, it's great reading and also beautiful uh, imagery like this injection photo here. It's just great. You should pick it up and uh, life in our phage world. We have a listener pick, sorry, uh, from Matt who writes, Hi TWIV host, beautiful 
65F, 18C, and sunny without a cloud here in New Brunswick, New Jersey. I'm a medical student here, and I love listening to your podcast on my commute to and from the hospital every day. I learn so much. I want to offer up a listener pick. Experiment.com is basically a Kickstarter for science. Scientists can use this site to crowdfund their research projects. There are all types of projects from biology to paleontology to environmental sciences and lots more. There are currently 12 Zika virus related projects and the one that has the most backers by April 27th, well, we're a little behind on this one. We'll get an additional $10,000. So if any listeners are interested, well, it's too late. And if any scientists are interested in crowdfunding an experiment, they should check it out as well since it's free to put a project on the site and they only pay a fee if they ended up getting the project 100% funded. I promise I don't work for them, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> I just love the idea of crowdfunding science and I think the people who are interested in learning about science from all of your great podcasts might also be interested in contributing and this way you don't need to be a millionaire philanthropist to do so. Thanks again for all the work you do, educating and entertaining. Keep it up. That's from Matt. And that, that'll do it for this uh, special episode of TWIV uh, here at Penn State at the uh, Living With Our Viromes meeting. I always want to say living and dying with our viromes. Because we, <laughs> we do die with them. You do, yes. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I don't know. probably changes. You know. yeah. Yes. yeah, pretty quickly. Really fast. <laughs> Somebody will look at that at some point. Uh, you can find TWIV at iTunes. You could find it at microbe.tv slash TWIV. In fact, over at microbe.tv, we have lots of other podcasts, microbiology, parasitism, uh, evolution, uh, even urban agriculture. Don't ask me why I'm doing that. <laughs> but it's there. We're also on Google Play Music. And if you have an iOS or an Android device, you can get a podcatcher for free that'll download the, vid the uh, episodes. So there's no excuse for not listening all the time. And we always like getting questions and comments. We didn't do any today, but we have lots. And you can send them to twiv at microbe.tv. I want to thank my guests today for joining us. David Pride from UCSD, thank you so yes. much. Yes, pleasure. Pleasure to have you here. Forrest Rower from SDSU. Thank you. Say hello to Stan when you see him. I will. <laughs> Alan Dove is at alandove.com. You can also find him on Twitter. Thank it's you, always Alan. a pleasure. Thank you for flying out. Yeah, yeah, it really was fun. appreciate it. Pleasure. And Rich Condit is an emeritus professor at the University of Florida in Gainesville. Thank you, sir. Sure enough, always a good time. And I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I also want to thank the meeting organizers, in particular, Mariah Spara. Thank you so much for having us here and all the other people involved in organizing. And to the last 10 of you who stayed to the end, I appreciate it very much. 15 here. Uh, 15, yes, 15. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs> <laughs>